You know, I want to preface my remarks tonight, everything that I say with that statement. Anytime God brings about change, it is always change for the better. Can I get a good amen? So there's a lot of people talk about, well, we need change, we need change, we need change. But if you'll think about it, when God institutes change, it's change for the better in our life. New covenant is a better covenant with better promises. God brought about a change. We think about change when God comes in upon us and he asks us to surrender our life to him. If you'll follow him, yes, there will be plenty of changes, but can I tell you, they will all be, in the long run, changes for the better. Somebody says, well, I sought the Lord and he wanted me to give up this relationship. Maybe somebody's single. I I, I felt the Lord wanted me to give up this relationship. But, you know, if you're doing the right thing, you'll have peace in your heart. You'll know you did the right thing, and there'll be joy in your life, and you'll realize in the long run that change is for the better. So tonight, what I'd like to do is talk to you about transition, facing transitions in life. If you realize that life has a lot to do with change, doesn't it? Some of you, I've been preaching to you for a long time, and you look different now than what you used to look, right? You look younger. But, you know, change is a part of life, isn't it? And if you'll think about it, all spiritual growth is a result result of change. I think in my own life. I've told the story many a times whenever I was a senior in high school, 17-year-old boy. uh, My pastor gave me a Bible. He brought us all up on the platform, all the graduates that year, and he handed us all Bibles. And when he handed me that Bible, I got home and I thought to myself, Lord, I want to read this Bible every day for the rest of my life. That's just the thought that I had. I thought, you know, I need to read the Bible. And I had the idea, and I think the Lord instituted that idea. And I said, Lord, with your help, put in my heart the desire. But Lord, put in my heart the desire to read the Word every day for the rest of my life. And you know, that one decision has totally altered my life. And then there was a period of time where I felt like the Lord put in my heart fast one day a week just two meals breakfast and lunch one day a week and and for many years that was just a discipline I had in my life and you know that brought about a lot of change in my life and then I think about times you know more recently I felt the Lord impress me to make some changes about things as it relates to prayer and I think about all the positive changes that have taken place in my life just because of little adjustments that we make. I think many times when, whenever the Lord comes to us, we think he's going to talk to us about doing something real radical and way over the top and, and, and something that's just totally, you know, foreign to us. But so much of the time when God talks to us, it's just about making a change here, a change there, an attitude adjustment here, And just, you know, those slight changes can really make such a difference in your life. So, transition. When you think about the word transition, it's just a passage. It's whenever you go from one position to another, or one phase of your life to another phase of your life. I know, you know, for many years I led praise and worship here. And and I know that when you have music, how you transition a song can make or break a worship service. I mean, you know, you can kind of flow from song to song or you can, you know, you can have a, a really move of the spirit. And if you don't transition right, it kind of can drop off the flow and the anointing as a result of that. So, you know, what I want to encourage you to do today is realize that, you know, change is a part of life. And so as you walk with God, there's going to be times that the Lord speaks to you about change. And you've got to be willing to say, okay, Lord, I hear that and I sense that. And I'm going to follow you in that area. Let me give you some examples about transition. A death of a loved one. Well, none of us want to lose loved ones. Sometimes the only one that wants to die is the loved one. Can I get a good amen? (laughs) Sometimes that loved one is the one that would really like to go on to be with the Lord. But humanly speaking, we want to pull them and we want to keep people where they're at. But yet, we realize that's a tremendous change whenever we lose a loved one. We think about career changes. I remember Larry, you know, whenever General Motors changed, and I remember talking to him the first month or so after he had worked the same job for so many years, and all of a sudden, it was gone. And, and I remember him specifically saying, well, just, you know, how are you doing, Larry? And he said, well, just think about your job. If all of a sudden, it just was everything you knew for so many years, it's changed. 
it just takes a little while to process that. And I did think about how would that affect my life. And so, you know, it can be in a career, it can be relocating. You know, nothing changes your life like moving to another city where everything's new. You know, you ask somebody for directions and they say, well, you go down to Walgreens and you go, where is Walgreens? Then you change, you know, it's just like there is no baseline. Everything is brand new. Everything is new. When I was a junior in high school, we moved to Oklahoma, and I can remember, you know, everything as a, as a 17 year old, actually 16 year old, had a, a map. And my, you know, friends would say, Well, meet me over here. And I remember having a map of the city, and I'm trying to figure out how to get over here, you know. And, and that was a big deal for me. And playing basketball games on church league team, and that, the biggest accomplishment wasn't the basketball game, it was finding that church, you know, with a map and, and getting there. You know, divorce is a change, a adjustment that people make in their life. So, you know, whatever you're facing, whatever I'm facing, whatever we're all facing, the good news is about the transitions that we go through, we're not going through them alone, right? It's not like you're transitioning, but you're all by yourself. And that's what a lot of people fear is, I'm going to be alone. If you move into a new city, I'm by myself. I don't know anybody. No, you know the Lord, and he's with you. Well, I've, got, you know, I've gone through a divorce. I'm alone now. No, you have a husband. His name is the Lord, and he's with you for the rest of your life. And, and so all of these different adjustments that we make, we need to get comfortable trusting the Lord. And, and, you know, the Lord really wants to get to the point where he is our best friend. He's very real to us. It's, you know, our relationship with him is just so close. You know, this morning I woke up early and I was just laying in the bed praying. And, and you know, I was just start praying in the morning and, and I just poured my heart out to God. And this is so precious. I almost hate, you know, you're almost hesitant to say it because you think, Lord, don't ever quit doing that. You know, that was really nice. And it was just like I was talking to the Lord and I said, Lord, you know, I just start off the day, just cover me in your blood. I said, Lord, just cover me in the blood of Jesus today. And I'm telling you, I heard in my heart the Lord say, I have that's a good way to start the day, isn't it? And then, you know, from there, just that assurance that he's with me. And, you know, I, I don't want to let anything jeopardize that relationship I have with the Lord. I'm not going to let bitterness. I'm not going to let any unforgiveness. I'm not going to let anybody or anything or any, you know, my relationship with the Lord is something I'm going to fight for. I'm going to contend for that. I'm going to do everything I can to keep that because when the chips are down, I mean, he's really all that matters in life. So I'm going to talk to you tonight out of Joshua, the first chapter. So as you're opening your Bible to Joshua, chapter 1, I'm going to talk to you about a man named Moses and also a man named Joshua. And this man named Moses dealt with change. He dealt with a loss of his mentor. You think about Joshua. I'm talking about Joshua here. He, he lost Moses. And Moses was a mentor to him. Forty years, he was an example, but he... He was kind of one of those guys that was bigger than life. I mean, he had had experiences of God. He had, you know, God had given him these Ten Commandments, and he interceded for the Lord. He was a Old Testament type of Christ is what he is. And Moses was an intercessor for the people. And then the day came where Moses died. And so Joshua was in one of those periods of transition. And, and it's interesting because if you want to know what to do during transition you need to read joshua chapter one because that's what the lord is doing he's taking a person whose his whole world has you know just been out of control and the lord's saying now here's what you need to do here's how i'm going to get you on track and so now joshua chapter one verse number one it says now after the death of moses the servant of the lord it came to pass that the lord spoke unto joshua the son of nun moses's minister saying now, the first thing I want to say about this passage of Scripture, the very first passage, during times of transition, God will talk to you. During times when things are kind of out of whack, I promise you this, God will be there to navigate you and to talk to you and to communicate with you. Now, I'm, I know God will talk to you every day of your life, you know, by that I mean he wants to get across to us and he wants to communicate with us. But the beautiful thing about difficult times are the Lord many times is so real to us and so dear to us. You know, several years ago, our son, it was the night before school started. I think he was going into first grade or second grade. And he got 
a stomach ache, talking about our oldest son. And he got cramps. That was the biggest thing. I don't remember him vomiting a lot, maybe some earlier in the night, but the biggest thing, he'd get these stomach cramps. And, of course, you know, when he'd get these cramps, they were new to him, and he, did, he would just really get scared, and he would start cramping and crying and, and going all about. And, and, you know, at first you start out, you're in your room, and he's in his room, and Sharon and I are back here, and he'd come down the hall and say, these cramps are coming, and then you you know, I'd get out of the bed and go up to his room, and then he'd come back down, then I'd get out. After a while, Dad learns, hey, Sharon, stay in the bed. I'm just going to sleep in there. <laughs> and so I just ended up sleeping on the floor in his room, and, and he would wake up in the middle of the night, and he'd start saying, Dad, it's, it's cramping again. And he'd start crying, and I'd say, but Luke, I'm right over here. I'm right here, son, and I'm not going to leave you. I'm going to be here all night long, and we're going to get through this, and God's with you, and you know, just to say that, in other words, during your difficult time, the Lord wants you to know he's right over here. But here's the good news, right over here for him is right in here. And he's right there, and he's going to talk to you, and he's going to, you know, be there, and when you listen to him, he's going to be talking to you. And so, you know, listen to the Lord. Now notice, Moses, my servant, is dead. Therefore now arise and go over this Jordan, thou and all this people, unto the land which I do give, which I do give to them, even to the children of Israel. So the Lord's saying, Now look, Moses is dead. And I want you to arise and go over Jordan. Now here's the thing that the Lord was saying to him Moses has passed away, but my plan for your life has not passed away. Does that make sense? In other words, you know, Moses is gone, but there's still stuff for you to do. There's a life for you to live. Matter of fact, you're just on the fringes of what I have for you. Now, Moses, in Joshua's eyes, he's thinking, oh, no, he's gone. You know, this is not only is he gone, but I'm gone. But the Lord's speaking to him and saying, but, you know, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now, therefore, arise and go over this Jordan, thou and all this people, into the land which I do give to them, even to the children of Israel. And so, you know, many of you know that, you know, the, the, when, you're, when you're in fear, when you lose a loved one, you just want to shut down. You just want, oh, Lord, you know, what do I do here? I, I don't know heads from tails. I don't know where to go. But the Lord's encouraging him. Now move on. I want you to move on. Verse 3. Every place that the sole of your foot shall tread upon, that have I given unto you as I said unto Moses. You know what the Lord says to him during this time of transition? If you'll get moving, hear this, I'm going to bless you. Does that make sense? Every place that the sole of your foot treads on. In other words, Joshua, i got to get you moving. Do you realize when you're standing still, you're not treading on anything? And so we need to move. We need to get moving. We need to move on. And, you know, I was thinking the other night, Larry and, and JT are here, but I was thinking the other night, or la to last night, I was over at the Nazarene Church here in town, and um, our son was involved in a program there. And, and I drove around that property, and if you've ever seen where the Nazarene Church is here on Main Street, it's a beautiful piece of property. It's a big old large area. And... Uh, and, you know, I've heard JT and Larry and others tell the story about one night they just got out there and they marched around that property and said, Lord, you said every place the sole of our feet tread would tread on, you'd give this in this land. They, they claim that land. And, and I thought, you know, they're, that, they, those people don't even know, but, you know, it didn't just happenstance. There had to be faith. Somebody treaded out that land. Now, here's what I want to say. When we get into fear, we want to stop, don't we? right? When we get into times where we don't know what to do, we just want to shut down. But the Lord said, now, Joshua, I know this is a time of great grief. I know this is a horrible time in the natural for you to think about moving forward, but you're going to have to get moving forward. You know, it's interesting because as a pastor for all these years, I've seen people have surgery. And one of the things I've discovered that has changed through the years, as far as surgery, 
they get you out of the hospital quick now. Have you noticed that? <laughs> I've learned if a lady's giving birth to a child, I better get there that afternoon. You know, because it's, a, it, it's like we're, we're going to get them moving. People have surgery. They have surgery. You know, they, oh, they've had surgery. Let them sit down and rest for a couple of days. No, 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 no. They're going to get you up moving. Here's why. We let you lay around, you're liable to get pneumonia. So get up and get moving. And I just want to say to us, there's a lesson to be learned. You know, if we get too settled in, if we get into rigor mortis and we kind of shut down, there's not a lot of good that's going to happen there. So what, what we've got to do is stay moving. You know, there's an old saying that a rolling stone doesn't pick up a lot of moss, Right? And we just got to stay moving and stay active and, and just constantly realize that, you know, you know somebody said two-thirds of God's name is go. And that is, you know, we need to be on the go. Now, that, does that mean we just randomly work ourselves? No, I'm not saying you just do a lot of stuff in your own might and your own energy. But I will say this, when you hear from God and when you hear from the Lord, the Great Commission has to do with sending us out, not shutting us down. And so be sensitive to the Lord. So the Lord said, you know, every place of the sole of your foot, will, I'm going to give it unto you, as I said to Moses. From the wilderness in this Lebanon, even unto the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites, and to the great sea toward the going down of the sun, shall be your coast. Now, if you get a map out, and we've done this before, and you look at the dimensions of what the Lord's talking about here, it's a very large piece of real estate. And the Lord's reminding him, not only do I have a future for you, but I've got a very big future for you. And so, you know, the enemy, we would say, what you're seeing right now, what I'm seeing right now is only the tip of the iceberg. And so what we've got to do is, is say, Lord, yes, you have a plan. You have a vision. There are people that, that I am to reach. And that land was all about, ultimately, not just Israel being blessed, but Israel being a source of blessing to other people. Verse 5, there shall not any man be able to stand before thee all the days of thy life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with thee. In other words, there's probably a tendency in Joshua's mind to think you could never see what Moses saw. Wow, we could never expect what Moses saw. And you know, this is what the New Testament church does. Well, I tell you, we could never see what Paul saw. But you know, the Apostle Paul would say, quit talking like that. Oh, we could never see what Peter saw. No, the works Jesus said that I do shall you do the also, and even greater works than these shall you do, because I'm going unto the Father. You know, you think about, you know, several years ago we had an athlete in the United States, Carl Lewis, set all these, all these gold, you know, all these records in the Olympics. But you know, it wasn't too many years after that, those records were removed. You have other people that, oh, they're a gold man. Nobody can touch Mark Spitz. Well, a few years later, somebody came along and removed. You know, so naturally speaking, we see records replaced. You know, in the kingdom of God, we, I believe the greatest days are the days that we're living in and God's wanting to do great work in the day that we're living in. Not only a great work, but he's going to do a quick work. He's going to do a tremendous work. So, you know, in his mind, he's thinking, wow, could I ever even touch what Moses did? And the Lord said, yeah, you're not only going to touch it, but you're going to see even greater things. No man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life as I was with Moses, so I will be with thee. I will not fail thee nor forsake thee. Be strong. Everybody say, be strong. Now you say, Pastor, well, I just feel weak as water right now. Well, you know, lean on God's strength. Be strong and of good courage, for unto this people shalt thou divide for an inheritance the land which I swear unto their fathers to give them. So be strong and be courageous. That's what the Lord wants us to do. Be strong, be courageous. For unto this people thou shalt divide for an inheritance the land which I swear unto their fathers to give them. 
Verse 7, only be thou strong and very courageous, that thou mayest observe to do according to all the law which Moses, my servant, commanded thee. Turn not from it to the right hand or to the left, that thou mayest prosper whithersoever thou goest. Is that, that's just a powerful scripture. Be strong. Be strong. You know, we have a man in our church here, Buddy Montgomery, and several weeks, it was several months ago, he, his health started going down, and he was hardly, I mean, I'd go see him in his house, and he hardly had the strength to get out of the chair. In fact, he, he had just sit in a chair when I would say goodbye to him, and, and his health was going, you know, and we were concerned, and he said, you know, Pastor, I got up one morning, and I felt like the Lord said to me, just be strong. And he says, so I just held on to that. Lord, you said, be strong. And then another morning he spoke to me and said, just have faith. Well, you know, if God says be strong, we can be strong. Now, you say, Pastor, I'm weak as water right now. Do you realize God is the one living in you, and we need to rely on his strength on the inside of us? I'm not talking about you pulling yourself up, you know, by the hair on your head, but I'm talking about God, you know, leaning on him. Lord, I need your strength. I, I need your ability. I heard about this one fellow, and, you know, he was out in, I'm going to say he was in Arkansas, all right? I don't know if any of you are from Arkansas, but anyway, he was from Arkansas, and he had this chainsaw. And, uh, you know, he saw this chainsaw down. Y'all have heard this joke, but I'm going to tell it again. Anyway, so he had this chainsaw, and he got, saw it at the, at, the, at the hardware store. They said, man, you don't need this old saw. What you need is one of these chainsaws. And so, you know, he, he thought, well, okay, this man knows what he's doing. He sells a lot of stuff down here, so he got him a chainsaw. And he came back to that store, and he said, I tell you, this chainsaw, it's just nothing to it. You know, he says, I don't, but give me an old saw back. And he said, well, what do you mean? He said, well, I, he got that chainsaw out, and he said, look at this old thing. It doesn't hardly work at all, you know. And finally the owner started it up, and, you know, and started cutting through wood, and he said, oh, that's how it works. Now, you know what, y'all? God doesn't want us to live for him in our own strength, but he wants us to live for him in his strength. I'm going to kick this habit, Pastor. If it kills me, I'm going to kick this habit. Well, I'm going to see you next week, and you'll still be bound. But when you get to the point where you say, Lord, Father, in my weakness, you're strong. And, Lord, I'm trusting you to just take this desire away. Lord, deliver me. Lord, I'm trusting you by your grace to help me out here, Lord. You know what? When that attitude is more effective than get out of here, I'm going to do it by myself. Well, you do it by yourself. You get all the credit. God does it through you. He gets all the credit. And so, you know, God doesn't ask you just to try to tough it out in your own ability. Look to the Lord. Let him be your source of strength and, and rely upon him. Notice verse number 8. This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then... Then, everybody say then. Then you're going to have good success. Well, you know, a lot of people want to get the good success, but they don't want to go through the other. Now, what is the other? The other is the book of the law. For us, it's the scriptures. Don't let it depart out of you. You know when he didn't say don't let it depart out of your mind? He said not let it depart out of your mouth. Because if it's not departing out of your mouth, it's going to be in your mind. So don't let the Bible, we would say, the Word of God, depart out of your mouth. But meditate, mutter, ponder, right? Meditate in the Word day and night. Murmur the Word. Speak the Word therein day and night. That thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written there. If you're not meditating the Word, you won't be able to do the Word. In other words, that's why I've got to meditate the Word. You can't be strong in obedience if you're not strong in meditating the scriptures. And then it goes on to say, then after that, you're going to make your way prosperous. You know, a lot of people say, well, you know, make my way prosperous, Pastor. Make my way prosperous. Yeah, that's what the scripture says. See, here's what happens. People get saved, and they've got Jesus in their life, and they go to church, and the, and the church, instead of helping equip them to live a victorious life, what do they say? 
Just hold on to Jesus. If you got Jesus, you're going to make it. And they'll say, well, I got Jesus, but I'm getting my brains blown out. You know, I mean, my life's getting all beat up here. Well, hold on to Jesus. You know what we need to tell people to do? Jesus said, right, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So if you hold on to Jesus, you're going to have to get in the Word, not only the person of Jesus, He is the living Savior. This is the written Word of God, and we're going to have to hold on to this. And what does the Word say? You know, somebody said, I want to draw close to the Lord. You know, when you draw close to the Bible, you're drawing close to God. Oh, Pastor, I don't, I don't know much about the Bible, but let me tell you what I know about God. Let me tell you, just zip it up. Because people that don't know much about the Bible don't know much about God. Because here's what they'll say. Well, the way I got this figured out, it doesn't matter how you got it figured out. What does the Word say? And then they'll use this one. I don't think God's like that. The way I see God is this. Well, you know, it doesn't matter how I see God, how you see God. It matters how God sees God. And so, you know, people get all kinds of crazy interpretations of what they think God should be like. God is his word. In the beginning was the word. The word was with God. And, and, and the word was God. And so, you know, grow, get to know God through the word. Get to go know God through the scriptures. And the more you meditate on the word and the more you familiarize yourself with the scriptures. Some of you do a lot of driving in your job. You don't just get the Bible on CD and listen to the Bible. Somebody say, oh, Pastor, I tell you, by the time my head hits the pillow, I'm out. It's hard for me to read at night. That's why you ought to do it during the daytime sometimes. Put, put the CD in. Listen to the Word. And, and, you know, just redeem the time. Look for ways to feed your spirit. And let me tell you, you don't have to read 28 chapters every day. I tell you, you can get a good dose just reading God's Word and letting it bless you. And so just, you know, get in there and get fed and get full of joy. So these passages of Scripture from Joshua chapter 1 has comforted, it's been a source of comfort for literally millions of people because it's inspired by the Holy Spirit. Let me just give you a few things that he said just to summarize this chapter here. Number one, what do you do when you're facing transition? What are you doing when you're going through change? You're going from one place to another place. What do you do? Number one, God told Joshua, Focus on your future. Because see, here's what the devil wants you to do, is for you to forget you even have a future. Now I know some of you say, well, Pastor, I, I, I'm kind of old. But I'm, I promise you this, in about six years from now, you're going to look, look at a picture of yourself that was taken in 2012 and say, wow, didn't I look young? Give me an amen. Woo, I was looking good then. Wasn't I? Okay, well, that's you now. And I got another revelation. You're as young as you're ever going to be right now. And here's another revelation. God will renew your youth like the eagles. So quit talking yourself down. Talk yourself up and talk yourself in the Word. So stay focused upon your future. You do have a future. The first word God gave him in Joshua 1 was, you know, now after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spoke unto Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' minister, saying, you know how I got this message? I got this message years ago. Y'all, many of you remember Paul Rosenberg, Patty Rosenberg's husband. He passed away, and I got before the Lord once, and, and I thought, Lord, I, I, give me a message for this funeral service. Give me a word for this funeral service. And, and, you know, I was before the Lord prayed, and the Lord said, he brought me to these scriptures, and he says, you know, if you're going to learn how to deal with death, people get, and it was the way the Lord put it to me, people get everybody else's idea about what to say to people when they've lost a loved one. I wish they'd just go to the Bible and see what I say to people when they lost a loved one. I thought, isn't that wild? I'd never thought of it. This is what God says to people that have lost loved ones. I don't know about Dr. Phil, and I don't know about all the rest of them, but I'm going to tell you what God's going to tell you in the face of it. And, you know, I got up that day and ministered to that family, and I felt like I helped them out. Today when I was in prayer, uh, the Lord just kept pulling me back. Joshua 1, Lord. This is what the Lord kept saying. You go to Joshua. You need to teach out of Joshua 1. And, 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 and I come across these notes that I'd had from some time back, and, and, and I just feel like y'all need to hear this tonight. 
All of us need to hear this. Focus on your future. The first thing the Lord told Joshua was to realize that even though Moses had left him, the Lord had not left him. The Lord wanted Joshua to focus on his future rather than dwell on the past. You know, human nature, you know what the human nature wants to do? It wants to think in the past, doesn't it? You know, there's a lot of accidents happen because people are looking behind them. You know, even when there's an accident, there's usually another accident because people are looking at that accident. And so, you know, we need to uh, look ahead and realize there's a future for you. The Lord wanted Joshua to think about a blessed future that the Lord had for him. Learn from the past, live in the moment, and dream about your future. If the devil can get you to feel hopeless about your future, he'll shut you down. And the first thing the Lord came to Joshua and did was remind him there's still a future for you. There's still good days ahead. And, 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 and let the past be a teacher and not a tormentor. Now, I'm going to tell you, every one of us got something in common around this room. If we could relive our life, we'd probably do a few things different. Right? I mean, if we could relive our life, I'd do some stuff different. You'd do some stuff different. All of us would do some stuff different. But can I tell you, we can't relive our life. The clock only goes in one direction. And so what we've got to do is learn from the past, but let it be a teacher and not a tormentor. And I can promise you this, it's never God that brings up your past mistakes. Now, if you want to know for certain whether or not it's the devil or not, if you're dwelling on past mistakes and failures, I can promise you, promise you, promise you, that's not the Holy Spirit, it's the devil. He's an accuser of the brethren. He's got a job assignment, and he's got a job description, and his name should give you a little indication because the name devil means slanderer. So it shouldn't surprise us, you know, that, oh, he's slandering me. You know, we should think, yeah, that's his name. Maybe we should change all the names from devil to slanderer and people get a grip, you know, on what really the devil's M.O. is. You know, that's his method of operation is to bring accusation. Now, I want to remind you of something. Your future is as bright as the promises of God. Oh, I don't know about my future. Well, I do. It's as bright as the promises of God. And so you've got to think, Lord, what do you say about this? So dwell on it, dwell on it, dwell on it. Don't allow yourself to base what your future is going to be like based on what the past has been like. Well, you know, I've always had problems. You know, you don't always have to have problems. You can get out of the wilderness and get over here in the promised land. And so, you know, you can't just base what my future is going to be a certain way because my past has been away. Did you know the gospel is all about bringing change into people's lives? And if you've got a spotted testimony, you got some, you know, you better be wise about even telling people about your testimony. Well, I tell people fully everything I've been through. Well, you better be careful. Because there's some people, you know, God forgives and forgives, but I can't tell you everybody else does. You know, some things you might just want to hold to yourself, not because, it's just because people, you know, they are people. And, and, and so, you know, God forgives us and moves on, and, but, you know, people are human. So just look at yourself through God's eyes. We must never be afraid to trust the unknown future to a known God. In the midst of Joshua's grief, the Lord told him that it was time to move forward. In the midst of his grief, the Lord assured him that the Lord had a promised land in store for him. Move forward. You know, nothing happens unless you first see it as a dream. And you've got to begin to see a bright day ahead. Lord, you know, I can see people I can help. I can see people that I can minister to. I can see people that I can help. You know, many of you all know the story of, uh, I don't know if you know this story or not, but, you know, Oral Roberts had a son named Ronnie that committed suicide up in Tulsa years ago. And, uh, you know, here you are, a high-profile evangelist and traveling the nations of the world, and then your own son loses his life. And, um, and he was tormented by this. You know, he was just devastated. 
And, of course, in that day and age in the church, you know, he said, you know, suicide as far as he knew, you know, Lord, what, you know, where is he now? And he just went through, put him through the ringer. And Brother Hagin tells a story. He said, you know, one day the Lord spoke to me and says, you need to go minister to Oral Roberts. And here he is, you know, at that time it'd be like Oral Roberts and this kind of an unknown guy that was up and coming named Kenneth Hagin. But the Lord said, he just put a call in through some people and said, look, I think I got a word for you. If you'll take, you know, if, if you want us to come visit you, I will. And so he tells, Brother Hagin tells a story how he went over to Ronnie's, I mean, went over to Oral Roberts and Evelyn's house there in Tulsa, and he just said, you know, I have a word for you. And there's a scripture found in 1 Corinthians where some people are given up to the destruction of their flesh, but their spirit is saved in the day of the Lord. And he said, you know, Oral Roberts said, here I was preaching all the word. And he said, I didn't even know that scripture was in the Bible. And he said, but you know, there are some people, their flesh was destroyed, but their spirit was saved in the day of the Lord. Now, I'm not encouraging any of you. If any of you have suicidal problems, come talk to me, all right? But I'm just saying, you know, the Lord spoke to him at that moment, and he said, you know, that was just like a band lifted off his eyes and off his mind, Brother Roberts, and it, it set him, and it, you know, and how that, that one spirit-led conversation helped him to embrace his future. So, you know, I don't know all the circumstances that you're dealing with, but, you know, God has a future for us. Can I get a good amen here? Nurture your mind with great thoughts. Nurture your, don't nurture the dumb stuff. Nurture the good stuff. You know, feed the good stuff and starve your doubts, right? Number two, how to face transition. The second thing the Lord taught to him was is that you're, your journey through the wilderness is en route to a promised land. The Lord kept reminding him about the promised land. And the Lord said in Joshua 1, 3, Every place that the sole of your foot shall tread upon, that have I given unto you. As I said unto Moses, from the wilderness in this Lebanon, even unto the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites. And, and he talked about all this land in the wilderness. Wilderness. You know, the promised land didn't always look like promised land. <laughs> Does that make sense? In other words, you know, they some of these cities were walled cities. Some of it was barren land. Some of it was, uh, it didn't always look the end product. And when God leads us and when God directs us, we got to be willing to just take it. And sometimes things at face value, they may not look the greatest. You know, when Sharon and I bought our home. Uh, you know, the homeowners had taken really good care of the home, but yet they really hadn't updated the home that much. The home was built in 1974, and maybe there were some modifications done, but there, there was a lot of... So we pretty much went through the home, but the bones, the structure was good. But, you know, room by room, we went... We, there, there's virtually nothing left, you know. Everything had to be changed. But see, I had had a background in building, and I walked in the house, and I could tell the layout, the floor plan's good, the structure of the home is good, the, the neighborhood's good. We can do all that. How many know paint? You can get paint real cheap, right? You know, wallpaper, that stuff comes down. And you can change tile, and you can change this. And, you know, they had this little uh, wooden divider between the den and the breakfast room, and my sister saw it and said, man, that looks like a confessional booth. We moved in that house, and Sharon had the confessional booth down instantaneously, you know. And then they had all this, instead of clear glass in the, the cabinet doors, they had this kind of plum color, you know, and Sharon had that down pretty quick, you know. But here's what I want to say. What you've got to do is your future, you may look at it and say, oh, it looks kind of bleak. Y'all, it's the promised land, but you're going to have to go inherit it. You're going to have to go in and plant some crop there. You're going to have to go in and drive some enemies out there. You're going to have to work with what God has given you. Well, I kind of think if God's in it, it all comes full blown. It doesn't come full blown. The kingdom of God is like a seed. You put that seed in the ground and first the blade, then the ear, then the full kernel on the ear. And so it's a progressive work. So, you know, when God's working in your life, you know, you, you can't just think, well, if I don't see it full, fully developed, it couldn't be the Lord. No, um, 
you know, just keep walking forward. It may not look great in the beginning stages, but keep walking forward. Abraham Lincoln said, I'm a slow walker, but I never walk backwards. And there may be times in your life you feel like I'm just kind of putting one foot in front of another. That's okay. Just don't walk backwards. Keep going. The, the good is in front of you, not by Egypt's behind you. Don't go back to Egypt, right? Pharaoh's behind you. Well, actually, Pharaoh got killed, so he's not even there anymore. There's another Pharaoh, right? I mean, you know, there, there's, there's bondage behind you. Go forward. Okay, so what did the Lord say, number one? The Lord said, look, you need to focus on the future. Second thing you need to realize is, is that, you know, the promised land is in front of you. Though it may not look like a promised land, it's still a promised land. Correct? You know, it, it may not look like it, but it is. It's the promised land. And then number three, the Lord said to him, be strong. Be of good courage. Now, being a good courage means sometimes you're going to have to go against your flesh. That means you're going to have to smile. Can I get a good amen? I tell you, we got three little kids, and by the time Sharon and I go to bed at night, we're, we're tired, all right? And Sharon had been working all day. I had been working all day. She had been working on homework, and I have been doing all. And I got into bed last night, and I just smiled at her, and I said, baby, I love you. And I was teasing her. I said, I don't feel it right now, but I love you. You know, she knew, you know, because we tease each other. You know, agape is not a feeling. It's a commitment. And we, I was just kind of teasing with her. You know, y'all, if we only do stuff when we feel like it, you know, we're in trouble, aren't we? Well, I, I tell you, not every morning do I feel like getting out of the bed. Not every morning do I feel like this, that, and the other. But, you know, we got we to gotta just be of good courage. Put on a smile. Praise the Lord. Somebody said smiling burns calories. So just smile away today, all right? You know, it's, it's contrary to your feelings. Somebody says, oh, they're just, they're just a happy person. Their circumstances just dictate. That's why they're so, if I had all their money, I'd be happy. I know people got money and they're not happy. I can take you into third world countries and they have zero and they're the happiest people in the world. I can take you, you know, into churches where they just smile all the they just smile and they're happy and they, they're, they're having church with string lights down the center of the church and they're just smiling, praise the Lord, and their services are full of testimonies. And, and if it was the North Americans in there, green goes from North America, they'd be in there griping. I tell you, it's a, there's mosquitoes all in here and they're just, woo, look what God has done. And so, you know, you need to adjust your attitude. And, and the Lord is the source of our strength. He's my inner strength. He is, as my days are, so shall my strength be. And so just, you know, how do you get more strength? Pray, Lord, strengthen me with all might in the inner man. Get plenty of rest. You know, you know, rest. Jesus, somebody said, well, did Jesus ever take naps? Do you know Jesus got in a boat and took a nap? How did he do that? There was a storm out there. Well, he had the peace of God in his life. You know, he, he took care of himself physically. You can't just run your body in the ground and disregard your body and never take care of yourself physically. And You're going to have to take care of yourself. Some of you, you would never do that with your car. But now you'll do it with your body. But you're religious. We've got to get that oil changed. got to get those tires rotated. We've got to get this done. We've got to keep this maintenance records up. But your body, all right, I want four Big Macs and supersize all of them, you know. And you'd never do that. You know, y'all, we got to tell you, I don't, I'm meddling now, all right? I'm wrapping this up. How do you face? And here's the final thing God said to him. God wanted Joshua to realize that he wanted the story of his life to be a success story. Did you know God wants you to have success in life? Last night, go to the next verse if you would, um, Sherry. Our son Luke and our children go to a Christian school, and this was their memory verse. This was their memory verse, and Luke was... We were coming back last night from here in Yukon, driving home, and he, he, was, he was quoting it. We were working on his memory verse, getting him ready for school. And he's got to have punctuation. It's got to be punctuation perfect. And, and he was quoting it from the NIV. Can you flip over to the NIV? Uh, 
and he was going through there and we were reading it of course I'd read a little bit of it and he'd he'd read a little bit of it and and I said now I'll be honest with you I haven't memorized verse 7 I've memorized verse 8 but I and so he was quoting it through in the last phrase here in the New International of Joshua 1 7 it says this notice that last phrase that you may be successful wherever you go and when I read that to him, I, I said that you might, I said, Luke, that's what I want for your life. I want you to be able to be successful wherever you go in life. Well, let me tell you, God is the one that started all that. His plan is that you would be successful. You know what it, success means? You're achieving things. Things are turning out well in your life. You're making significant advancements in life. The Lord doesn't want your life to go from one failure to the next. The Lord wants you to know what it's like to have good success. So God created man to succeed and not fail. Do you believe that? God didn't create man that he just watch him have a messed up life. God wants us to be blessed. And, and here's the deal. The closer Tom walks in obedience to the word of God, the better off life turns out for me. That doesn't mean I don't have problems. It doesn't mean if I walk with God, I know I have no heartaches. Jesus was led of the Spirit into a wilderness. There are times you were led through seasons that are challenging. But the Lord's with you in those challenges. And take the word with you in the challenge like Jesus did. And spend 40 days in the wilderness and not 40 years in the wilderness. Now here's what people do. Well, you know, the children of Israel were in the wilderness 40 years. Did you know they were out of the will of God too? They shouldn't have been there for 40 years. The only reason they were there for 40 years is God penalized them one year for every one day. They were in unbelief when they, were, they refused to go in and take the land. They came back with a bad report, and the Lord said, I'm going to penalize you one year for every day that you were in that land, and you came back with a bad report. And so what we do is sometimes we think, well, you know, God taught Israel a lot of stuff in the wilderness, but the wilderness was the permissive will of God. God really wanted to get them through that land. And you look on a map and you realize how far they went in 40 years as Rick, you know, showed us Egypt and Israel, the wilderness. You think, how in the world can you spend 40 years there? You understand that? It's just not that far of a distance. And to say, you know, I drove to Tulsa. How long did it take to get there? 40 years. Well, you know, you'd have to try to be law and God doesn't God's not trying to string it out God knows how to get you from point a to point b and I'll tell you this when we murmur when we complain when we set up idols in our heart when we get our priorities out of whack we're going through life like this we're just zigzagging through life we're getting turned around we're wasting time and time is precious you know this man that wrote the book 23 minutes in hell if you haven't read that book, you ought to read it. 23 Minutes in Hell, and then he has a counterpart now, 23 Answers About Hell, a book. And he answers questions about hell. He tells about when he came back. He says, as I came back into my body, he said, I saw a little puff of smoke, and then it vapor, just, just vapor, and it was gone. He said, Lord, what is that? He said, that's your life. He said, what? He said, that's your life. Your life is but a vapor. It appears for a little while, and then it's gone. In other words, in the eyes of God, your life is so short. And so it's important that we not, y'all, if you got short time, you don't have time to be, oh, I'm going to zigzag around, I'm going to whine, complain. People, you need to get your focus and get your head down and say, Lord, what are you calling me to do? And I'm not only going to walk in your commandments, but David said, I will run in the way of your commandments whenever you have enlarged my heart. Time is short. Can I get a good amen on that? Time is short. I told somebody this story today. I was watching this preacher on TV. You ever watch somebody on TV and get aggravated? Have you ever done that? A couple times. Well, I saw somebody on TV, and they were preaching. They kind of got me aggravated because I thought, you know, they're not. What they're saying isn't right. Lord Jesus, you know it, and I know it. Everybody's hooting and hollering. I knew it wasn't right. Not because I'm the authority, but just based on Scripture. And, and so, anyway, they were doing all this. And I thought, Lord, now, come on. What are we going to do about this? How long are you going to let this go on here? And I'm telling you, the Lord spoke into my heart. And he said this. 
the time is short. You know what I meant when he felt like, you know, maybe not everything he's saying right, Tom, but he's getting people saved. He's getting people filled with the Holy Spirit. And the time is short. That's like telling the lifeguard, their technique isn't quite right. Are they saving lives? Oh, yeah, they're saving a lot of lives. They say 18 yesterday. Hey, if it's working, their technique might not be, you know, Red Cross approved, but let's let them do their job. And so, you know, we have an important season ahead of us. We got we to gotta run to win. And, and I don't know what you're facing in life. And I don't know what transitions you're going through in life. But I, the big thing I want you to take away from this message, the number one word the Lord gave Joshua was, Joshua, come on, Joshua, listen to me. You're going to have to get up. You're going to have to start walking that direction. And you're going to have to put your feelings aside and be strong in the Lord. And you'll be able to make. And can I tell you, everybody in this room, everybody under the sound of my voice, at some time in your life, you're going to need the message I shared tonight. Every one of us are. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, I just pray right now, Lord, that you would help every one of us tonight to do exactly and learn exactly from this Joshua chapter 1. Lord, this isn't the word of a man. This is the word of God. This isn't just the ideology of man. But Lord, this is the word of God. And I just ask you right now, Father, that you would speak to every one of us. I pray for people in this room that are in transition. I pray for people in this room that life has been spun around and things are different for them. I ask you right now, Lord, to just help them. Steady them, Lord. Steady them right now. And Father, we just give you the praise in Jesus' name. I want everybody to lift up both hands right now. Would you do that? Just lift up both hands and say, Lord, today... I call upon you, I call upon you for your strength in my life right now in the name of Jesus. You know, the Bible talks about David encouraged himself in the Lord. Under the translation it says he found strength in the Lord. So I just want to encourage you tonight, wherever you're at, just the Lord, I, I encourage myself in the Lord. Praise you, Lord Jesus. Father, I bless you tonight. Lord, I give you the glory. I don't know what you're facing, but I know God's your answer. And he cares about you tonight. Praise you, Lord Jesus.